eradicating violence against women in South Africa. The government's under pressure to act. The president has announced an emergency plan. But is that enough to protect women? And what are the root causes of the violence? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Imran Khan. South Africa is one of the worst places to be a woman. So says Cyril Ramaphosa, and he wants urgent action to tackle such violence. The president has announced an emergency plan to stop rising assaults on South African women. At a special sitting of Parliament on Wednesday, Ramaphosa pledged $75 million for a series of measures to curb the problem. He's also promised to make sure perpetrators are held responsible for carrying out killings and rapes. Recent incidents have sparked protests in South Africa, calling on both the government and businesses to take stronger action. Here's what Ramaphosa plans to do. We need to make the necessary amendments to our laws and policies to ensure that perpetrators of gender-based violence are brought to book. We will make substantial additional funding available for a comprehensive funding package of interventions to make an immediate and lasting difference. We will also complete the implementation of the decisions that were taken at last year's presidential summit on gender-based violence and femicide. As we hear from Rochelle Pimentel, what victims of sexual abuse and violence are calling for is more action. Let's hear more about her story. Your family ostracizes you. Society ostracizes you. Because I've been gang raped where they cut off my nipples at 16. Um, my, the man that, um, that raped me from six to nine he was living in my parents' home, and uh, he broke my nose. And my mom was at work, and he said to my mom, the swing hit me, you know, when my nose was just bleeding continuously. My mom was murdered in 2009. My husband beat her to death. Her spleen was ruptured. She bled to death, you know, and that's my fight. You've been abused and you've been raped, and they've taken away every single thing of you. They're not just taking away um, your body. They're taking away your mind. So right now I'm in, very, I'm in so much pain, but I have kids and I need to keep them strong. And this is my story and this is my plea. You know, let's do it for those kids, for our kids, for South African kids. You know, we've been, I've been there. I've been there and it's worse than death. And it's not just people like Rochelle Pimentel. Let's have a look at some of the figures. Sexual offences recorded by the police, including rape, have risen 4.6% this year. More than 41,000 cases of rape were reported between 2018 and 19. This is at least 100 reported rapes a day. More than 2,700 women and 1,000 children were murdered by men last year. That means a woman is murdered in South Africa every three hours. A 2016 report by the World Health Organization ranked South Africa amongst the four worst countries in the world for femicide rates. Let's bring in our guests. Lizette Lancaster is the manager of the Crime and Justice Information Hub at the Institute for Security Studies. She joins us on Skype uh, from Pretoria by Mandisa Konyule, who is director of Rise Up Against Gender-Based Violence and joins us from Johannesburg. And Jolene stein is a senior research specialist in democracy, government, governance and service delivery at the Human Sciences Research Council. She joins us by Skype from Port Elizabeth in South Africa. Welcome to you all. I'd like to begin with you, Mandisa Konyule. Cyril Ramaphosa has said it's the most unsafe place in the world for women. Uh, the UN seemed to echo that. Yet this isn't a new problem. This seems to be a generational problem. So why are people out on the streets right now? Well, people are out on the streets right now because since last year, 
when the total shutdown march happened on the 1st of August to try and bring one awareness towards how bad the scourge of gender-based violence had become, but also to give solutions to government from civil society in the form of 24 demands. Those 24 demands expired on the 1st of August this year, and only few are halfway through towards implementation. So women have taken back to the streets to say, but government, we gave you demands, we gave you solutions, but it doesn't seem to be that you're actually doing any implementation. And of course, we then saw some of, uh, some of the new cases that actually got quite a lot of media attention, such as Uyinene's case, where she was actually raped and killed during broad daylight at a post office. So some of those cases basically created some, a, a national anger and an uprising where women are saying, we've had enough, and you know what the solutions are. Government, please take action. So that's basically the situation that we're in at the moment, where women are angry and they wanted to see decisive action from the government, hence the joint sitting that was called on Wednesday. But, Mandy, so what does that de decisive action actually look like? What are you calling for? OK, so of the 24 demands, one of which is a, na a national strategic plan for gender-based violence, a costed national strategic plan, to actually map out a way forward as to what we're going to do about the scourge. We want a GBV council that's going to basically create a situation where we have a national response from prevention and response for GBV. We wanted an automated registry for protection orders. What actually happens in South Africa, for example, if a woman uh, has a protection order or what you call a, um, a restraining order in other countries in one province. It doesn't actually apply in the next province. So essentially, your perpetrator can chase you from one province to the next, and you have to have a fresh protection order for each and every one of the provinces. Instead, government could have one system that is automated, that works at all the police stations, that could protect survivors of gender-based violence from their perpetrators. That's one of our demands. Sensitization training for the judiciary, as well as the police, and other stakeholders that directly directly liaise with survivors of violence. We do find a lot of secondary victimization of survivors when they are actually in the system. Legislation such as the hate crimes bill being implemented that actually protects the LGBTQIA community. These are just some of the interventions that are listed in the 24 demands, as well as things like making sure that there's funding available for domestic violence shelters in the country, which are grossly underfunded. In actual fact, you get 70 rand per day for a woman in a shelter, whereas a prisoner in prison gets 350 rand a day. You're better off as a perpetrator in this country than you are as a survivor in terms of how the government actually takes care of your needs. Let me bring in Lizette uh, Lancaster here from Pretoria. I was actually speaking to a friend of mine who is a researcher in gender-based violence. She's based in Cape Town. And I asked her this question. I said, look, is... Is, why, why is this happening now? And she said to me, look, one of the reasons is you just don't go to the police in South Africa for anything. You go and you get a number for insurance purposes, but you don't expect them to do anything about this. And for too long, women are either dismissive of the police process, they say it doesn't help them anyway, or they're too afraid to go because they'll be seen as the victim. Is there an institutional security forces problem in South Africa? It is absolutely a problem. But the, as Mandisa has pointed out, you know, the, 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 the challenge or the problem is not exclusively the police, but they are a great part of the problem. We are sitting with intergenerational inter, um, um, violence here. And we have to understand that our police members also grew up in these households that have seen and experienced violence in the schools that are seeing and experiencing violence in the same communities that are rife with violence. So... And also they carry the same um, toxic masculinity often that, that is associated with our society. So it has um, been a problem and a challenge in this country for the past 25 plus years to, to sensitize the police to deal with um, victims of gender-based violence in a sensitive way to, to ensure that there's no secondary trauma. But we know that doesn't take place. Furthermore, there's often a move to, to treat these cases as not serious, that, um, you know, the police shouldn't intervene and they shouldn't take it seriously. And we've seen community policing forums, for instance, also intervening in what they call these domestic, um, you know, just little arguments that, that just needs to be um, dealt with. But we know, too, that the leading cause for death amongst women are 
because of intimate partner violence. So there's a dire need to deal with policing in this regard, in not just how they investigate these cases and deal with these cases, but also how they deal with victims of these type of violence. Let me bring in uh, Jolene Steinkotze in Port Elizabeth. So clearly there does seem to be, at least on one level, a policing institutional problem, but perhaps it's wider than that. Is the government uh, or successive Africa, uh, South African governments haven't taken this issue seriously? Is what Cyril Ramaphosa trying to do now with his £75 million, with this announcement, uh, something they'll be able to change governance generally and highlight uh, what's going on against women in South Africa? You know, I think for me, uh, when we had the joint sitting, I, I always got a sense that it was a very reactive response. Um, Gender-based violence and femicide in this country is really, really not a new phenomena. There should have been policy, stronger policy interventions much earlier so that we do not reach this situation where, as we know, one woman is killed every three hours, for example. For me, there are two elements at play. You now have President Cyril Ramaphosa throwing the proverbial money at the problem, you know, making resources available, which is very welcome, but it will go back down to that implementation phase. Um, how are you going to e uh, monitor and evaluate what the policy responses are and what impact those policy responses have? Policing is one aspect of it. Um, and sensitizing police officers and those within the ju judicial system. For me, I think we need more progressive policy interventions. Um, we know in, in certain cases, laws have been passed um, in other countries to, to allow women to take time off work if they are busy leaving an abusive relationship. So they don't have to be concerned about their job security. Mandisa pointed out earlier, 70 rand a day um, for a survivor of gender-based violence vis-a-vis -vis what a prisoner or a perpetrator gets. Um, for a woman who may be economically dependent on her partner and has children, even though there might be a desire to leave and a very intimate knowledge that I may die in this relationship, the fear potentially also of who's going to look after my children um, may keep a woman, so to speak, trapped in that, in that situation. Uh, lastly, I would say if we had a progressive policy agenda, I would argue for a civic education program because we need to start changing the narrative about gender violence and femicide. Um, it is not women who must avoid being victims. It is not women who need to avoid walking alone at night. Uh, it is not women who needs to, to look, watch out how they, they dress and what they wear. Um, it is not women who constantly need to lock their doors at all time. We need to start changing this narrative and say that this is a collective effort and not only the responsibility of women. Mandisa, let me bring you in here. The narrative needs to change. That's what we're hearing from our guest in Port Elizabeth. But that needs to change a lot earlier than when they get into the criminal justice system. It needs to begin at home. It needs to begin with the education system. There needs to be a structural change here against toxic masculinity attitudes um, developing in the first place. How are you going to tackle that? That's a, a structural change in society. Well, firstly, we did recommend, uh, we do have a curriculum uh, called life orientation. Uh, we do have life orientation as a subject in the curriculum uh, from uh, primary school level all the way up to high school. And conversations that should be happening even at primary school level from a grade one perspective is understanding consent. So uh, age-appropriate education, explaining what consent is. Also, once they get a little bit older, understanding healthy relationships. What does a healthy relationship look like? What does an unhealthy relationship look like? And then also understanding early signs of violent behavior. So this is what we could do from a prevention perspective, but it could also generally help in terms of understanding the social ill from a childhood level. Because as you said, once they're already perpetrators, I mean, the job is already done to some extent and we can't really be fixing adults, but we really do need to do a very strong, comprehensive social behavioral change program that starts as early as grade one with these kids at school level and it needs to also continue whilst they're teenagers and then becomes obviously more age appropriate when they become adults. I think it's imperative 
that the understanding around what actually constitutes violence and what is violent behavior. Because people understand that if someone snaps you across the face, that's violent, but they don't necessarily understand economic violence. They don't necessarily understand emotional violence. So these are some of the conversations that we need to have as a nation and we need to popularize them. Again, one of the demands was a 365 day campaign headed by the government uh, communications information system, whereby you actually have a program similar to what we did when we had the HIV AIDS response that educates the entire country around the scourge of gender based violence, creates proper awareness and also gives advice as to what to do when you find yourself in that situation. A lot of survivors don't know where to go. They don't know how to access particular services. They don't know how to access shelter services. They don't know what to do once they actually enter a police station, when they report their case, what is the next step? How do they enter the criminal justice system with their perpetrator? All of these things, they need to be walked through these processes and they need to be assisted by a proper comprehensive social behavioral change program. Mandisa, do you have confidence in uh, your leader to be able to deliver anything that you talked about? Can Sora to do any of this? I would not want to preempt that he can or cannot do it. I have faith that he will try. I do think that this is one of those things that needs all hands on deck. It needs departments uh, to actually start working together. They work in silos. So right now, that's why the GBV Council is so important, is that there needs to be a coordinated effort around GBV. It, the president has announced he's allocated resources. It's now up to his departments to be pushed to actually do the implementation work to end the scourge. Uh, Jeline, you specialise in democracy, governance and service delivery. Do you believe that the government has the tools at its, at its disposal to be able to do this? You know, it's, it's one thing having tools. Um, you know, it's one thing having making those resources available. It's a very different thing when it comes to implementation, monitoring and evaluation. And that is where political will comes into play. So, for example, Mandisa is talking about a, a gender-based violence council who, if established, I can foresee that such a council would play a strong role in monitoring those policy impacts. Um, for example, if you are going to increase the number of shelters, it doesn't help that you increase the number of shelters and people don't know how to access them or people don't access them for various reasons. There's got to be a solid evidence-based uh, policy-making approach to these interventions. Um, and again, part of that for me would be your political will and not just, you know, the, the, the quick and easy solution is always throwing money at the problem, but not necessarily looking at what you are getting for your buck once you start dealing with the, with the situation. Monitoring and evaluation for me will be key. Monitoring and evaluation. Uh, Mandisa, let me bring you in here. A lot of this is to do with men. Men need to change their behaviour. Um, is there a crisis of masculinity amongst South African men that's leading to this? What are the... Why is this happening? It, this seems like, you know, four women, uh, three women an hour being killed is an extraordinary figure. So just try and help us understand why this is happening, why men are doing this from that perspective. Well, it's, it's simple. Men don't think women are human beings. They think that we're property and they think that they can own us. It's a simple thing where when you hear their conversation amongst themselves, they're like, my girlfriend cheated on me, therefore I'm justified to beat and kill her. As though that person's body somehow belongs to you. We need to really change that psyche and that, and that understanding. There's, there's a very strong... Um, uh, evidence that toxic masculinity is not just harmful to women, it's also harmful to men themselves. The stupid myth that men don't cry, uh, men should always be the ones providing for the household. Then you find them in a situation where we have such gross inequality in this country, where they are under pressure that they shouldn't be under, and they take that out on women and children in the most harmful ways. So uh, they, 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 
Toxic masculinity definitely needs to be addressed and dealt with, but we also need to deal with the socioeconomic issues that are behind that and that are manifesting themselves. And as I said, playing out in incredibly violent ways. Uh, Lisa, in Pretoria, this is a problem that has to be dealt with culturally. It's a problem that has to be dealt with through education and legislation. Can it be dealt with practically uh, by the criminal justice system, by the education system? I mean, how do you do that? How do you provide a practical solution that, you know, stops this? So the World Health Organization in Inspire Pro uh, framework is very useful. And we have seen that many of the, the type of initiatives that have been um, implemented here on, on local level um, have been very successful. So there are many interventions in South Africa that have proven to work such as aftercare programs, um, such as anti-bullying programs, and so forth. The question now is how can we upscale these to more um, larger areas? How can we measure them? How can we make sure that the funding is there? Because we know that these can be successful. For instance, in Kenya, just an anti, uh, you know, an, um, school curriculum uh, uh, intervention has proven to be highly successful in changing attitudes of especially boys ar around how they perceive women to 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 act and what and to to break down that toxic masculinity so there's a lot we can do and a lot is being done what we do need is now this implementation that we're all talking about it is the plan that the president has uh, said needs to be implemented in the next six months. That might be a little bit ambitious. We really need to put the baselines there, make sure that whatever we do is evidence-driven and that the in um, interventions are measured properly and that the money goes to those that, that, that really do make a difference and that it's costed correctly. Um, we are busy with mapping as many of these interventions as possible in order to make sure that we understand what works, where and how. Uh, Mandisa, I see you um, agreeing there. Um, however, I'm just going to put this to you bluntly. Surely we just need to lock these people up. The criminal justice system needs to be stronger and that will be a deterrent enough. Look, uh, the entire prison population of South Africa is below 300,000 people. There's 56 million South Africans, of which it's estimated over 8 million of them have been raped. So we just don't have enough jails to lock everybody up. It's a fact. Um, I think what we need to do is ensure that, one, we prevent violence from happening, which, is, which should be the key priority. And when it does happen, we need to have adequate response mechanisms in place and a functional criminal justice to prosecute. Because because a lot of these cases do actually get into police stations but never find themselves into courtrooms because prosecutors say, well, you don't have enough evidence and we're not even going to prosecute. So jailing everyone, honestly, isn't the answer. It's not a sustainable answer. It's not an answer that we can afford. And also, I don't think having people locked up in prison with other perpetrators and further, I'll be honest, I don't think the prison system at the moment actually... Uh, rehabilitates people. I actually think that they come out much worse and they end up reoffending. So I don't see how putting them in the system would actually work. I think we need to change mindsets. I, I really need a strong understanding of consent uh, to permeate throughout the minds of South Africans so that we ensure that this doesn't happen to more women. We already live amongst rapists and murderers. It's a fact. We just need them not to reoffend, and we need to ensure that when they do actually get prosecuted, that they stay in jail. You have people serving six-month jail sentences. Locking them up is definitely not working. Uh, thanks to all our guests, Mandisa Konule in Johannesburg, Lizette Lancaster in Pretoria, and Jolene Steinkotter in Port Elizabeth. Uh, you can watch the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Imran Khan, and the whole team here, bye for now.